Find your future by exploring your world. The Massachusetts School of Law challenges their students to explore the important issues of our time, learning from experts in fields like politics, sports, and business law. From first-hand accounts and dramatic reenactments, in-depth conversations with society's leaders, from historians to lawyers, from high-tech professionals to environmental experts, the Massachusetts School of Law at Andover presents MSLaw.edu. One of the biggest decisions for young adults is higher education. Going to college is a big investment in time, money, and effort. Students are faced with many questions. Where should I apply? How many campuses should I visit? How much financial aid will I receive? What really matters to colleges in the admissions process? Welcome to mslaw.edu, brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law. I am Diane Sullivan, co-host for today's show. We will talk to some of the professionals who work to make this complex process a little easier to understand, beginning with Boston University's admissions associate vice president and executive director, Kelly Walter. Kelly, when is the earliest a student can apply for college admission here at BU? They typically begin at the beginning of their senior year of high school. Boston University subscribes to the Common Application. Tell us how that works. Uh, so the Common Application is an application that is shared by over 500 colleges and universities across the United States. So it is a common application that students complete once and then is submitted to five, six, seven colleges that they may be applying to. The Common Application launches, so come, becomes live on August 1st. Is it recommended that a student seek early admission? Probably should clarify some concepts if you don't mind. So there are many early programs at colleges. We have early decision at Boston University. We also have early admission. Early admission is for a junior in high school who has exhausted all their curricular requirements and feels ready to jump into college a year early. It is a very rare um, student who takes advantage of that opportunity, but it does exist. I think what you're probably asking about are these early action and early decision programs designed for seniors in high school who have decided where they'd like to go to college most and therefore indicate their preference or their interest by applying uh, earlier than the deadline of January 1. So we have early decision. The deadline was November 1st. It has come and gone. Uh, we have students whose applications are being reviewed right now, and they will be notified by December 15th. Do students ever breach that agreement? Unfortunately, students do, but often there are legitimate reasons. Mm -hmm. um, before a student applies early decision, at least at my institution, the student has to sign an agreement that indicates that they understand that this is binding, and that they shouldn't be applying anywhere else. Their parents must also sign this agreement because we want to make sure everyone in the family understands um, what they are doing, what the implication of being admitted uh, means. And then we actually ask the student's guidance counselor to also sign this agreement. So all parties that are involved in this college search process sign this statement. And so therefore, the likelihood of a student um, saying, I can't honor this commitment is, is much smaller. What percentage of students would you say seek an early admission? So we enroll a freshman class of about 3,600 students. Wow. <laughs> um, it is um, a large class, but of course we're a private teaching and research university. Um, uh, we enroll about 18 to 19 percent of our class early decision. Mm -hmm. So that's just over 700 students that say, be you, this is where I want to be. They're competitive for admission. They get great news in December. They can celebrate their holidays, but they still have to finish their senior year yes. and finish well. What can a student do to make themselves a, a more sought after applicant? Um, this whole notion that somehow students have to package themselves is something that frankly is very distasteful to me. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, this is a, a very important decision, but it's the student's decision. And he or she needs to go through some process of self-assessment, really think about who they are, what their goals are, 
what they hope to achieve, what their aspirations are, and really think long and hard about the kind of environment in which they'll thrive. The answers to those questions should help guide them to the kind of college or university that will be a good fit. And that notion of fit is so important, far more important than rankings. We want students who enter here as freshmen to do well, to excel, to thrive, and then to graduate four years later. That is the ultimate goal for all of us, for students, for families, um, for the university, for our faculty. So we do care about how students are doing in the classroom. Um, and in fact, it's the best indicator for success in college. But we're also looking for students who will contribute in some way, enrich the university community, because this is a community. And students are not in the classroom 24-7. It feels like it sometimes, <laughs> but they are not. And we want them to be involved in student government. We want them to be on our mock mediation team. We want them to do community service. We want them to participate in stage troop. So we are looking for students who are inquisitive, hardworking, have been successful academically, but we're also looking for students who have some real strong passions. So a student's activities while they're in high school or maybe even while they're in junior high school, how important are those activities in your consideration for that person as an applicant to BU? There's a great myth out there <laughs> among high school students that somehow more is better. And students come to us with these resumes that are three pages long. My resume's not <laughs> even three pages long. And they really think that they, if they're involved with 15 or 20 activities that somehow that is going to strengthen their application for admission. The reality is that colleges and universities are looking for students who have found themselves, who know where their interests lie, and have made a commitment to one or two things. I would, I'm going to use my niece as an example. She has been dancing ballet since she was six years old. She now spends five days a week going to ballet class, um, participating in recitals. It is an extraordinary commitment, not unlike an athlete who is playing basketball or soccer. Um, and that's her primary area of interest. She doesn't have time to do a lot of other things, but she knows what she loves. Mm -hmm. Colleges and universities like to see that. Interesting. Discuss, if you would, the significance of letters of recommendation and what advice you might give an applicant as to what type of letters to bring. So most uh, selective colleges and universities um, subscribe to this holistic process, which means we're not driven by just an SAT. This is not a formula. We want to get to know who the student is to begin to answer that question about fit. And teacher recommendations and counselor recommendations are one of the ways that we go about doing that. With an applicant pool as large as mine, which was over 54,000 students last year, wow. uh, for this freshman class of 3,600, wow. we obviously don't know what it will be this year, but we rely on teachers and counselors who are in the classroom each and every day with students to tell us about who they are, uh, what their successes are academically. Uh, they're the ones that can give us some insight into what they're like in the classroom. Do they always come prepared? Uh, do they ask questions? Do they challenge their peers? Uh, do, are they able to identify when they're struggling, come in for help? Um, but they're the ones that can give us um, their sound advice, their sound expertise about whether or not a student can handle the rigors of a college classroom. Are there certain things that help you eliminate uh, to get down to a more reasonable number that you can then fill your spots from? Are there some red flags that are warnings that, hey, this person may not be successful here? Um, we certainly begin our review process by looking at the high school transcript. We know what kind of preparation students need in order to be successful here. And students need to be achieving at a very high level to be competitive for admission to BU. The typical student we admitted last year had an A minus average. So we begin there. But it's not just grades. And that's another 
uh, uh, myth that's out there. Um, we really are far more interested in the level of rigor that's in a student's high school curriculum. Have they pushed themselves to take honors or advanced placement level courses, advanced placement level courses in particular, because those are college level classes being taught in high school. And if a student is taking a few of those and doing well, I think it increases our confidence that they can do the work at Boston University. High school courses that are honors level or advanced placement courses are taken by a student. It is suggested that that is a better indicator of a student's ultimate success at the college level. Why are so many institutions still making admissions decisions by the numbers, be it SAT or ACT scores? I guess I would challenge you a little bit. I don't know that colleges and universities are making admission decisions solely based on just SAT or ACT. Um, so my institution does continue to require standardized tests for students. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason, and we have this discussion every year, mm -hmm is that we have students with 54,000 applications. They are applying from high schools, not just across the country, but around the world. And it is impossible to compare high schools. Right. High schools, even within our state of Massachusetts, are very different. Um, some um, are in urban locations, some are private, some are public, some are very large comprehensive high schools, some are in very wealthy uh, districts and others that are less affluent. Right. So high schools vary tremendously and to compare them would be like comparing apples and oranges. So the SAT or the ACT or achievement tests or AP exam results is another measure that at least is a level playing field in the sense that the SAT Johnny takes in Massachusetts is the same SAT that John, uh, Susie is taking in California. Temple has become test optional. Brandeis is in, I believe, their second year of a pilot program in which there are alternatives to, to ACT and SAT scores. Is this the wave of the future, do you think? I don't know if it's a wave um, because this has been going on for 10 years. Um, since the College Board changed the SAT the last time, which was about nine years ago, mm -hmm. um, test flexible and test optional programs, um, more schools started participating in them. That's the reality. With the advent of the new SAT in the next two years, it will be very interesting to see if a larger number of colleges and universities decide to move in the direction of being test flexible. I think that's the wave as opposed to test optional. Applicants often have to submit an essay. Correct. What advice would you give to our viewers in the audience who are trying to construct that essay or assist somebody who is? I think students should know that essays are read and they're read carefully and they're far more important than students imagine mm -hmm. in the admissions process. What I say to students is, imagine 54,000 applications. Your essay <laughs> is your one chance to tell us who you are, to tell your story, to make yourself stand out, to distinguish yourself from your peers. And it's a powerful voice in an admissions uh, application file. I think it's important for students to write well, of course, make sure it's grammatically correct, mm -hmm. But equally important is to make sure they tell us who they are. And we have a funny phrase here at Boston University where we say to students, be you. And we really mean that. Be yourself when you're writing your <laughs> essay. Don't try to be someone else. But really, everyone has something that's unique about themselves. And it doesn't mean that you've um, climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. I mean, I think students think big and grandiose when they hear words like be distinctive. Um, that's not what we mean. Just tell us your own story. One of my favorite essays last year was by a young man who wrote about his grandfather. Most students have a grandparent and they'll say, that's not unique. But it was the story this young man told about his grandfather who didn't finish high school, who never had an opportunity to go for higher education, and that how his grandfather instilled in him from a very young age how important it was to do well in school, 
to reach for the stars, whatever your dreams may be. And he was a great um, motivator for this young man. And this was a young man who wasn't the strongest student in our applicant pool, but his essay was fo so poignant that we decided to give him a chance. It so essays make a difference. It is interesting how many of our elders who were deprived the opportunity of education see how important it is and inspire you know, their family members to pursue education at the highest level. Right. Would you accept an application from a student with a GED certificate? Without a doubt, yes. And then how do you assess the student? First of all, they get a GED diploma, mm -hmm. and we get GED exam results. So we know where they fall in relation to the norms on the GED. So we know where their strengths are because they give us individual GED scores for mathematics. So we get some information. We don't have four years of a high school diploma, but we understand how well they did um, on the GED. We still ask for letters of recommendation. If the student has been out working, we would ask for a letter of recommendation from an employer because often these students have life experience that we want to know about. Sports at BU and many of the Boston schools are, you know, where it's at for kids. So how do you deal with a student applicant who is really an athlete? We're a Division I institution, so yes, sports are important. We want winning teams for both our men and our women, so um, athletics is important to Boston University. But the admissions process and the athletic recruitment process are parallel processes. But admissions is handled by admissions, and athletic recruitment is handled by the coaches um, of our athletic teams. They let us know when they're interested um, in a student. Uh, they let us know if um, a particular candidate is going to be life-changing for a team that's going to take us to a national championship. Those are things that we want to take into consideration, but at the end of the day, admissions decisions are made by admissions. I think most people don't think it's that way. They think there's a separate deal made for the athlete that doesn't have to comport to BU, for example, standards. Right. So good I mean, information. If a student is a recruited athlete, there are guidelines and standards that have to be met by the NCAA. Right. And because students are often asked to sign what's called a national letter of intent, that comes from the athletic office. It does not come from admissions. And I think that's where some of the confusion comes mm -hmm. into play because the national letter of intent says to a student, you know, we want you to commit to Boston University for fill in the blank sport. This is not a letter of admission, but if you're admitted, these are the conditions that you need to adhere to. So I think even though that is very clearly in our mind, not a letter of admission, there is some misunderstanding about the weight that that letter carries. And it does carry weight. We've looked at a student and said to a coach, we think the student can be successful at BU, but it's still not an offer of admission. Let's discuss graduation rates. What percent would you estimate of kids graduate? How many do so in four years? And finally, what percent go on to masters and doctorates? Outcomes, as, as they're called in yes. our business, um, has become ever more important for students, for families. It's on the front page of newspapers. And what we do here at Boston University is we actually survey all of our recent graduates to find out what they're doing in the first six months after they finish in May. Um, and we're doing that right now with the class that graduated in 2014. But for the class of 2013, uh, which is the last cohort for whom we have these survey results, within six months of graduating from BU, 90% of our students are either employed in graduate school or in the services or in the Peace Corps or Teach for America, some other service organization like that, and 10% are still looking. Um, so I think that's a very powerful number within it, six it months. It is. And do you think that today's applicant is looking at an institution and say, what's the likelihood I'm going to get a job if I pursue this degree at this institution? Parents are looking at mm -hmm. outcomes, um, and they should. 
because what they're trying to ask is what is the value of this degree? Will it open doors for my son or daughter? What are the chances of employability or grad school? And I think colleges and universities should be expected to supply that data. Do most students graduate? Yes. Uh, as you probably know, uh, for students who begin college, only slightly more than half of them ever graduate. That's the national um, average, but at Boston University we're well above that. Uh, our overall graduation rate is 85, 86 percent, and of those students who graduate, 94 percent of them do it in four years. And I think that's another piece of information that parents need to be aware of. Um, you don't want this college degree to turn into a five or six year investment. So what are the things that they are most looking for? Why Boston University? You know, some of the common themes are certainly the city of Boston. There's absolutely no doubt about it that students who are applying to Boston University like the idea of an urban campus, that hustle and bustle, um, knowing that they have access to internships, to restaurants, museums, all of that that comes with being uh, a part of an urban uh, metropolis is very, very appealing to our students. But we also, you know, I think about what BU is all about. From the very beginning, we have been a research university, a teaching and research university, and there's a culture of inquiry here and innovation that our students really respond to. And, you know, one of our earliest professors was Alexander Graham Bell. So the phone was discovered by a BU professor. And while that's ancient history, students understand that the new ideas and the new discoveries of our future may very well happen at Boston University, and they want to be part of it. It used to be that a student who really had dreams of coming to BU or any a number of other colleges, they could work in the summer, raise enough money to pay your tuition, and that's not an option today. So I, I would think that the cost of an education is too much for certain people to, to be able to really go to the college of their dreams. I mean, college is an investment, and I can't say that enough. For sure. But this is where students have to work with people like me admissions officers, but also with their college counselors. Any final words for students on selecting the right college? Think about what you're looking for. Um, to know what your academic areas of interest are, how far away from home you're willing to go, what your family is willing uh, to provide in terms of financial support, but most importantly, ask questions and come to visit our campuses. Over 25 years ago, we said legal education was broken. Change is uncomfortable, but it's often needed. So we rolled up our sleeves and we fixed it. Schools are just too expensive. Ours isn't. Most schools don't teach needed professional skills. Ours does because our professors continue to have real world experience. Too often you settle for a career that's less than what you hoped for. You shouldn't. Come see the future. The Massachusetts School of Law at Andover. Your future starts here. Federal courts have a number of lawsuits pending relating to the compensation of college athletes. Recent court rulings regarding the NCAA have made changes in how the athletes are treated. Dean Coyne sits down with Brad Bates, the Director of Athletics at Boston College. With respect to the recent court decisions, with respect to the medical and legal issues that we see emerging now in professional sports, is this an exciting time or a trying time to be the athletic director of a major university that tries to excel in both academics and athletics? Well, I think it's always exciting to have intellectual challenges and try and predict the future. Uh, everything we've got to do is just um, access as much information as possible and try and anticipate the direction of these, some of these decisions. And, you know, you have to move forward with the current context and then adapt to whatever deci decisions are made in the future, and that's kind of what we're doing. But predicting the future at this point has to be harder than it's ever been for, for, for college athletics. I mean, it looks like if one were to follow these cases to their natural conclusion is that major changes are coming 
uh, for college athletics and how it does business. Yeah, really good point. Uh, depending on the decisions that are made in some of these legal court cases, there could be significant change. At the same time, you've always got to be grounded in your overarching uh, principles. And obviously our focus is, is to try and maximize the development of our students. Would you expect that at some point in the future we may see paid college athletes, at least in basketball and football? We have professional sports. I don't know that if you're going to integrate athletics within educational systems, there, there's a, a place for professional athletes. And when you come to Boston College, you've got to remember every time you talk about paying athletes, you're diluting the value of an education. When you play at Boston College, that's a quarter of a million dollar education. If you're on full scholarship, you graduate debt free. The significance of that um, context, I think, is, is great, and we should never diminish the value of it. How does uh, Boston College try to balance that um, test with respect to both excelling in academics, which obviously is principally why the, many of the year most of your athletes are here, and um, athletic performance, because uh, you have boosters, you have everyone that wants to be able to say the team is doing great, but at the end of the day, you're dealing with 20-year-olds, 22-year-olds who academics is uh, their primary um, responsibility. Well, the intellectual development of our students is always going to be a, a primary focus of what we're doing. But at the same time, we really believe that this is an athletic curriculum in the hands of very talented coaches. And there's a, a strong developmental component in participating in athletics. And so the, the integration of that athletic experience and the academic experience we believe can really maximize student formation. The key is having coaches who recruit students who can thrive in this environment. And it's not for everybody, but we feel like we, there is a, an elite group of students out there who can really come to Boston College, fully engage the experiences here, and leave here prepared to lead in whatever endeavors they choose. What makes a great student athlete? It really is a combination of things. It's their experience K through 12, it's their preparation, it's, it's the people who have been around them before they come to Boston College who have shaped them and influenced them and really uh, helped them define their, their core values. And when those values align with an institution like Boston College and their athletic performance and their intellectual and academic profile, I think those things really help define what Boston College is looking for in terms of a great athlete. Uh, it's not exactly related. We have a trial advocacy team and what I've noticed is that for many of those students, the ones that have played competitive sports earlier in their life and especially at college, have the drive to excel that I, they see in academics as well. And especially at this institution, I would imagine that you not only grab great athletes, but you do grab great students because of the academic demands in this institution. Oh, no question. Our coaches do a great job of identifying students who can thrive in this environment. And, and to your point, there are a lot of attributes you acquire through your athletic experience. And how those transcend other endeavors that you engage can really um, contribute to your growth and formation. When you uh, are recruiting athletes, are they generally held to the same academic admission standards as the other students in the building? Well, the quick answer is yes. Um, will we look at different profiles, of course, just like other aspects of the institution? Athletics has nothing to do with admissions at Boston College. That's run by our College of Admissions. Despite what the coaches sometimes may want, <laughs> may want you to do? Yeah, I, no coach at uh, Boston College wants to bring a student in here who can't thrive in this environment. Uh, any coaches that are doing that are really exploiting the student for their athletic ability. Mm -hmm. That's not the culture that exists here. Now, as they work through the admissions process, um, at what point then do you start to look at uh, potential scholarships and things along those lines? Coaches are really identifying students sometimes as early as their freshman and sophomore year in high school and looking at their academic engagement at that point in time along with their athletic ability. When you identify students you know, sophomore, junior year, you really have a good uh, snapshot of what they're capable of doing intellectually as well as what they need to do intellectually to finish out their high school education. And so that pool may be small. What's the message that you would want to get across to those of us sports fans that are interested in both academics, graduation rates, 
as well as the performance of the teams themselves. Boston College is one of the top ranked schools in the country, regardless of whatever ranking system you look at. Of those top ranked schools in the country, there are only 13 that compete in the Power Five conferences at the highest level of the NCAA. Our student athletes every day are competing against some of the brightest minds in the world in their classrooms while every week competing against some of the greatest amateur athletes the world has to offer. There aren't a lot of schools that provide that opportunity. And let me ask you a little bit about the graduation rates because I know at the Miami the graduation rates were impressive while you were the athletic director. Boston College has always done very well in that regard as well. Is that a matter of some pride to you in, in your performance both at Miami, Ohio in here. A big focus of our department is the retention and graduation of our student athletes, particularly across the distribution of majors. Uh, our most recent focus, interestingly, we're, we're trying to really hone in on uh, career and job placement opportunities for our student athletes. So one of our department goals is now to place a high percentage of our student athletes in careers that they're excited about and passionate about before they graduate and so we're connecting them with the BC network, which is vast. What's the message that you would want to tell to the student athlete who might be thinking that, geez, BC is uh, uh, on my list, but maybe it's a little too academically rigorous for me, or maybe their uh, performance isn't quite what I would want if I went down to Alabama or one of those football factories. We compete at the highest level of the NCAA, and you're gonna graduate from one of the most prestigious schools in the country. And oh, by the way, we're in this really cool city. <laughs> So you're going to combine some great attributes and have a wonderful experience. And our coaches are going to care about you as an athlete, but they're going to care about you on and off the field and develop you holistically. And it is a great city and a, a very impressive campus walking around this morning. Uh, it's, uh, it's a terrific place, yeah. terrific facility. Stunning, uh, unbelievable faculty. The university administration is really focused on student formation and the Jesuit ideology really comes together to make it a complete package. Let me ask you a little bit about the recruiting aspects of it. They're looking at trying to encourage uh, students to come here. How early can uh, the colleges start to begin that recruiting process? There's, we've heard horror stories that, that potentially even the eighth grade. You hear those stories periodically. At Boston College, we're not getting, we're not looking at yeah, kids quite that early. <laughs> it is getting more and more competitive and, and coaches are looking at freshmen and sophomores in high school. Not as many freshmen, but it is getting earlier and earlier each year. The competition's really significant. At the same time, our coaches are very careful. They recruit character. What is the earliest point where um, a college recruiter can make contact with a student athlete. We've got 31 sports. I can't keep track of all the rules and it varies between programs. Oh, it does? If you're talking to a sophomore in high school, for example, there are limitations on how you can do that and when you can do that. Uh, often when they're really young, you got to work through club or high school coaches. And so depending on the sport, it varies on when you can first make contact. Also the manner of contact. So it's not just a phone call or a visit. It could be a text message or a yeah, Facebook chat, whatever, could potentially uh, actually violate the rule depending on the sport. That's right. And so we have a compliance staff that's uh, very good in educating our coaches. Our coaches are very much aware of what the rules are within their sport. And as you can imagine, there's an integrity here that we follow the spirit of the law. It would seem to me that if it varies by sport that there could potentially be more of a chance for, for a technical violation even if it was, it was well intended. You'd almost think that the rule is, should be at some point, well not, nothing below a freshman or nothing below a certain age because it would sound like, sound like there would be a greater chance that someone's just going to make a well-intentioned mistake. You'd be surprised at how knowledgeable our coaches are about and, and they have to take an annual exam, they have to be certified to be able to recruit. It, it's very well defined by the NCAA. Oh, there's actually an examination process and they're tested on oh, a regular yeah. basis with respect to what the, what the compliance requirements are. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting to know because I, I, I wasn't aware of that. I'm not sure most people are. Uh, and that's the way you would continue to be able to be eligible to be a college recruiter. That's right. That. You have to pass at a certain threshold in order to even be able to recruit, and you take that annually. Oh, that's interesting. Let me, let me ask you, I saw um, Blue Chips with Nick Nolte recently again. A great, a great movie. Not here, but elsewhere. Is that, is, are those pressures real, and is, is some of that likely, and is that why we need a strong NCAA compliance 
unit? The quick answer to your question is almost every rule is, is typically a reaction to something that took place that uh, was perceived to give an institution an advantage. And so I would say that um, most of these rules are in the name of trying to have some sort of competitive equity. Do conferences have additional rules that schools are required to, put play, to, to comply with? If you guys belong to the ACC, do they have additional requirements for member schools with respect to uh, recruiting? There are some, but not a lot of variants, and most of them have to do with uh, interconference transfers. So if a student wanted to transfer from one ACC institution to another, but for the most part, the NCAA rules are the overarching guide for what most schools follow. So when a player chooses to uh, become a student athlete for Boston College um, and receives a scholarship, and now depending on the sport, there are, uh, some sports have more scholarships than others. Mm -hmm. Under what circumstances then does the student, having committed, uh, be able to keep that scholarship? Are there times where they will lose the scholarship because of academics or other disciplinary behavior and things like that? So when there's a commitment made to a student about a, a scholarship, that commitment is really seen through the student's graduation. Are there situations or bad decisions a student could make that could cause them to lose that scholarship? Absolutely, and you reference one. If they decide they don't want to attend class, for example, if they violate the student code of conduct for the university, they could risk losing their scholarship. So there are certain examples where a scholarship could be pulled they cannot be athletically related reasons. In other words, if a coach makes a bad decision on whether a student athlete is good enough athletically here we can't pull, or, and that student doesn't work out, we can't pull that scholarship. Whenever there is a scholarship pulled at any institution, including Boston College, that student has a right to a hearing by a, a panel of non-athletic department employees across the university so they can present their case and that panel can make a decision on whether they would support the athletics, athletic department's decision to pull that scholarship or not. Could they quit the sport and still retain the scholarship? It's not likely, yeah. um, but again, if they quit, they still have the right to a hearing and they could present their case and the panel may decide on their favor. And what if players are injured once they do attend? Is that, uh, that medical insurance and the like provided and medical care provided by the institution? Yeah, so if a student is injured and can no longer continue their athletic career, it's called a medical hardship by the NCAA. It's signed off on by the team doctors, and they retain their scholarship through graduation. And I think more recently, where I read the story, and it was, uh, it was a great story, is that one of the walk-ons um, had ultimately obtained a scholarship because, through his hard work and his performance here. Um, under what circumstances do you guys decide that uh, the walk-on gets a scholarship? Because that was a really... Uh, it was a great story, and it was a great thing for Boston College to do, and it obviously meant a lot to the young man and his, and his parents when I read the story. Yeah, that was a great story, and, and certainly a tribute to that particular student and mm -hmm. his work ethic and his commitment to the program and the institution. Uh, it really is a, a matter of what the coaches feel in terms of the students as well as the number of scholarships they have available. So if a, stu if a coach has scholarships available, Rather than sign someone coming in from high school to that scholarship, they may choose to give it to someone already in the program who's certainly earned that. It was very impressive, actually, because you know we would have played anyway. You know we loved the experience. You didn't have to do it. And um, it, it said something about the integrity of the institution and the coaches to have done that. And the symbolism of honoring the values of performance that you really are striving to instill in all of your students. How many of the student athletes end up uh, going on to uh, professional sports? Do, you, do we keep that statistic? It's a, a pretty healthy number relative to the percentages because if you look at the national numbers, there are very few that have opportunities to go. And it's predominantly in our, our most visible sports, football, basketball, hockey, we have some baseball players and some soccer players. We have a soccer player that played for the U.S. in the World Cup last year. There's a handful that we have here, and, and again, this, this is really a tribute to the type of students that are attracted to Boston College. They're getting this incredible degree, and they're competing at the highest level of amateur athletics. I know Title IX requires you to take a hard look at both balancing the women's and men's athletics, but how, at the end of the day, are you able to do that where some sports have a significantly greater interest among the fans who want to attend and other sports there could be a handful of people at any given game. A big part of our job administratively within athletics is to make sure that we're satisfying the requirements for Title IX and other federal guidelines. 
And so there are some, in some areas, there's um, more room to uh, define how you're going to approach that. In other areas, it's very clearly defined, and so you have to strictly adhere to what their requirements are. Does the potential unionization and even paying for student athletes' performance, as if other schools tend to start to do it, it's obviously problematic for BC as well. Does that worry you about the balance that we try to strike between women's athletics, men's athletics, and just sort of the overall, there's a lot of sports on campus, but there's not, not always a lot of fan interest in those sports but the big ones that could be affected obviously are your basketball program, your hockey national championship hockey teams as well, and your, your football, which are predominantly men's sports. Yeah, I, I do worry about some of the legal decisions that are, have already been made and some that um, seem to be focused on male sports and the possible consequences relative to Title IX of those legal decisions because at least in some of the preliminary decisions that have been made, it could create a context that's contradictory to Title IX guidelines. So that's definitely something we worry about and we're monitoring. The other part of it is we potentially are going to create a, you know, sort of a super class of athletes on campus at, to some extent at the expense of others. They'll, they'll have video games that not only will bear their likeness, but they'll be getting royalties from potentially as well with these new cases. Yeah, depending on how the, the decisions are made that come out of it. If you had to put your crystal ball on, what would be the the future of either athletics as a general matter at the NCAA level or, or at Boston College? What would you see as the, either the issues confronting major college programs in the next five years? Well, I don't know about crystal ball. Maybe if I could write the script, I would stick to our core mission, and that is to maximize student development and formation, and to use this athletic curriculum and integrate that within an academic curriculum so that our students leave here as, as leaders and have success in shaping whatever endeavors they engage, then I hope that the future of college athletics really pays attention to the, the inflation of expenses in athletics, really pays attention to the opportunities that we're currently providing, and really makes sure that there's an equity in terms of how we engage our students. Because we work in higher education, and our mission should always be student development. Stuck in a cubicle, Jess was going nowhere. Carol made the switch from a tech company. Everald was an undergrad who knew he wanted more. He deserved more. Find your future at the Massachusetts School of Law. Immerse yourself in a fun, supportive campus environment. Learn professional skills from instructors with real-world experience. Take the first step in changing your life at the most affordable law school in New England, the Massachusetts School of Law at Andover. Your future starts here. The cost of higher education continues to rise. Online applications and deadlines are complex for most young adults and families. University of Connecticut's Director of Financial Aid, Mona Lucas, tells us where to start. We always encourage parents to start by filing the free um, application for federal student aid, the FAFSA. Mm -hmm. That's an application that's going to ask families that for their most recently completed year's income. Most need-based financial aid at universities across the country, colleges across the country, typically use the result of this free application for federal student aid. So that's where we ask families to start as early as January of the year the student plans to enroll in college that fall semester. Is it virtually impossible for a child to do this all on their own? Yes, I think I would agree with that. Um, in most cases, the application is going to ex uh, ask a student who's under the age of 24 to provide parental information. So the student can certainly complete part of the application, but in more, um, m most cases, it's also going to ask for parental income information. What if you have a family that's not intact and perhaps the student has little dealings with one parent and the parent won't give the information. What do you do about something That's like great that? Great question, and that does happen from time mm -hmm. to time. What we do in those situations is encourage the student to connect with the institution he or she is interested in attending. Um, what we have the authority to do is to treat, uh, review each student's case, case by case, and to evaluate special or unusual circumstances. Oh, that's great. Um, so in that, uh, 
situation, we may be in a position to um, utilize either the student's income, income information or perhaps one parent's. Oh, that's so important to know for certain uh, students. Explain how the combination of financial aid, scholarship, and loans works together. What generally happens, and this may vary school to school mm -hmm. um, because policies are established at each institution, the process begins with that free application for federal mm -hmm. student aid. But at the point the student applies for admission to the university, in many cases the university, um, typically the admissions office, is reviewing the academic profile and a student's activities while they were in high school, perhaps either at the high school or in their community, to determine whether or not the student meets the criteria for merit or talent-based awards. Mm -hmm. And financial aid, at the same time, is behind the scenes calculating what might be available from the need-based side, that, that really is not linked to academic profile um, as long as the student is admitted into the institution. So the first notification a student may receive is going to be um, whether or not the student was selected for one of the merit-based awards, because okay. that generally comes along with the offer of admission to the institution or shortly thereafter. And when in the calendar year is that going to come to the student? That's great. That would be generally February. Okay. Um, probably early March at the latest is when the admissions offers are rolled out. And then, um, so in that, again, maybe along with the admissions offer or a week or so following the offer, generally the merit announcements are, are sent. Um, slightly later than that, and, and I'm talking now by weeks, maybe mid-March, um, it could be April at some institutions, but typically mid-March, the need-based awards, um, we start to unveil those or, or, or issue those need-based awards. What must happen at institutions is before the need-based offers are issued, uh, financial aid must take into account resources that the institution is aware that have been awarded to a student. So the student has been awarded a merit award, financial aid will look at that merit award, um, combine that with whatever on, is available on the need-based side and just make sure a student isn't over-awarded. Um, generally these days, based on the fact that um, there are generally larger pools of students eligible for financial aid mm -hmm. than some institutional budgets um, can support. So uh, it works best when a student does receive perhaps a merit award and a combination of need-based money and put the two sources together and that put that is a um, more attractive financial aid package. Now, when I talk about the need-based package, that's where the loans um, come into play. The need-based forms of financial aid include grants and scholarships, which are our need-based scholarships, which are our most deferred forms of financial aid. Sure. But we also have loan programs as well as work programs that are need-based um, forms of financial aid. So we put together what we call a financial aid package, and that would be a combination, hopefully, of loans, grants, scholarships, possibly work, and then any other resource we are aware of. If the student is low income and have no resources available uh, to put towards their education, are there enough programs that a student could still come to college? Yes, that, that right. is the case. Um, the, and, and it, again, policies vary from college to college, university to university. Um, I would uh, venture to say the focus on assisting low-income students or what um, we may think of them as high-need students, mm -hmm. um, you know, everyone's committed to trying to remove those financial barriers so that students have an opportunity to enroll in college. Um, the student certainly may have to accept loans, may have to accept a need-based um, position, uh, uh, you know, 10 hours, 15 hours of work study on campus, mm -hmm. but we try to put together um, a financial aid package using sources from the federal government, the state governments, um, as well as the institution. And when you pool those resources, you are in a, posi a better position to offer a competitive financial aid package. It's important for students to note that it's doable even if they don't have the resources uh, to, to obtain the education initially. Yes, and what worth noting also um, are uh, tuition payment plans. So let's say a student has no financial support from the family based on the family's income and the financial aid package still has somewhat of a gap between what the student owes the for, for the um, cost of attendance for a year 
versus what the student was awarded, then many institutions participate in payment plans that allow the students to pay whatever's left over the course of 10 months. We want to make the university affordable and, and um, payment plans are one way um, to help a student or a family meet those um, financial obligations um, spread over the course of maybe 10 months instead of um, paying everything up front. I would imagine though that would result in some hefty payments and put some students in a position where they'd have to be working a lot of hours and that takes away from study time. Absolutely. Um, in some cases the payment plan is more of a um, it may assist families who are in a position to pay, yes. but just may need to stretch the payments out over time. The process of applying for financial aid seems to be overwhelming to many parents and students. One mother reported that it was like having a part-time job working 20 hours a week. What is your take on that? I would agree that it um, can be a bit daunting, particularly the first time a family um, completes the process. Um, there are a couple things I we I like to encourage families to do. You know, the, number one, the the beginning of the process, the free application for federal student aid is is online, mm -hmm. and there. Um, now, that doesn't make it necessarily any easier that the fact that it is online, but there are um, prompts that are built in to help families avoid common mistakes, and that then ultimately delays the process. The um, the other thing that's a big help today is the database match with the IRS because some of the key data elements come directly from the income tax returns mm -hmm. and a family can opt to have their data reported to the um, Internal Revenue Service pulled into the free application for federal student oh, aid. Okay. Um, th now, um, some families are going to have to apply for financial aid before they file their income tax returns in order to meet priority deadlines. Sure. And then it makes it a little more difficult because in that case they're trying to estimate what their um, adjusted gross income may be. And it, it is, I mean, I, I jokingly say to um, families at, at um, recruitment events that the federal government has definitely streamlined the approach to financial aid um, application over the years, uh, but there may be over 80 questions on the new and wow. improved, you know, yeah. uh, free it's application for federal student aid. So they continue, the federal government continues to try to streamline further, but it can be a bit overwhelming, which is why families really should start early, um, perhaps take advantage there. In most states, there is a College Goal Sunday event um, across the country where aid administrators man phones throughout the day on a given Sunday. Parents and students can call in um, and or even visit the locations and with their uh, in income information and aid administrators will actually help them through the process. Oh, that's great advice. What is the approximate cost of a college education? And feel free, if you'd like, to distinguish public and private. These are ballpark estimates. Sure. Um, you know, today's public university with uh, tuition fees, room and board universities may cost a student twenty-five thousand mm -hmm. dollars in some cases uh, for a large public university. Um, tuition fees, room and board, miscellaneous expenses such as books and supplies. It may be twenty-five thousand um, dollars. That may translate into um, forty, forty or forty-five thousand if it is a private institution. Sure. How do the New England regional tuition agreements work? My understanding of those agreements are that a particular major is not offered in the state a student, a state of a student's resident. Um, that student may attend another New England institution that's part of this agreement mm -hmm. um, for a slightly reduced rate. So it would not be the, um, the out-of-state rate but it okay. would not be quite as low as the in-state rate. It's kind of something in between um, that allows a student a break on the price um, because that program is not offered in his or her home state. As costs go up, have you seen applications decline in recent years? We have not seen a decline in not. applications. We are very fortunate that the institution commits, is, is quite committed to assisting as far as um, providing financial aid resources for students who would not otherwise be in a position to attend the institution. So as the cost of, in, of education increases, the financial aid budget has also increased. Sure. So um, now I can't speak to um, other institutions, but that's the way it's worked here. 
What trends do you see coming down the pike to make education more affordable and accessible to most kids? The continuation of the institution's commitment to in states, in, uh, commitment to financial aid um, is certainly that's you know at the top of my list as a financial okay. aid administrator mm -hmm. um, because I think um, as with many things in our um, um, as in our country, prices increase. There you know there's an inflation, so. Um, as costs increase, as long as we keep pace and with the funding to um, assist the families who have no other means of paying to it college tuition, then I think that's um, my preferred solution. According to the U.S. Department of Education, students are defaulting at private schools at a rate of 22 percent on their student loans. It's about half of that at a public institution. What do you think accounts for it? Is it that kids don't get jobs right away, or they have insufficient income to pay the high cost of a college education? I'm thinking, uh, and, I, and I've read a little about this recently, I'm not certain the students fully understand that they have, there are options early on, there, mm -hmm. there are options. Um, I think the federal government realizes that everyone doesn't um, exit the university and enter the workforce right away. Um, and those who do enter the workforce right away may not make, um, you know, a very high salary as entry-level employees. Um, but there are several student loan repayment options that take that into consideration that a student earlier in their career is, career is going to be making less, so their payments are slightly lower early on. Um, there's also recognition that some students may need longer than the six months after graduation to mm -hmm. find a job, and there are deferments um, available for students who are certainly seeking employment but have not yet secured those, um, you know, employment. The students got to get very active once they graduate to see what options are available if they feel they can't make the payments. Exactly, and then to stay in touch with the lender or the government, I guess we would say, the Department of Education throughout their search for their employment because um, yes. the Department of Education wants to work with the students mm -hmm. and doesn't want to see students default. Sure. But if the students don't stay in touch with them, um, the department will have no way of knowing that, oh, it's just a matter of, you know, the student's still lo looking for a job yeah. or the student needs somewhat of a um, reduced uh, repayment plan to start, you know, for, for the first couple years sure. of, of employment. What is the public service loan forgiveness program? Students who go into public service positions, um, I, I don't know all of the details on the program mm -hmm. that don't come to mind, but what, what I um, recall is I think it's your, if you, the student agrees to work in, in, in does secure a position in public service, that should count as their, um, as maybe perhaps a portion of their student yes. loans are forgiven because there's recognition, in, you know, number one, some of the public service positions do not have the salaries that, or offer salaries that are um, comparable to those who may go into um, law or something that, you know, may pay a little bit more. Um, the country certainly needs public public servants, and this is certainly kind of makes it a win-win for certainly those does. whose hearts are in the right place and they want to serve. So look into your crystal ball and tell me what you see in the future as alternative methods of financing and education. I'm very, very hopeful, and I think I see this at, at many institutions, um, just an increase reliance on um, donations from students who have already um, attended the institution from alumni, sure. um, fundraising, um, those who are kind of out in the world and in a position to give back. Um, I think in the next five years or so, if I were to look at my crystal ball, that's where I would see the most hope for um, additional dollars that would ultimately go to students who are um, in a financial situation that um, does not allow them to um, afford the full cost of education. John F. Kennedy said, let us think of education as the means of developing our greatest ability. Because in each of us there is a private hope and dream which, fulfilled, can be translated into benefit for everyone and greater strength for our nation. So until next time, explore new areas of interest, observe, analyze, and you be well.